Church. Good morning, Access Church. Qué bueno verlos aquí esta mañana. Es un privilegio para nosotros eh, poder juntarnos este domingo y poder adorar el nombre de Dios. It's an honor for us to be here and gather together and worship uh, our God. Uh, we want to start this morning with uh, a prayer time, and um, I was I was just thinking. Uh, before we pray, I was just thinking about God's love. And uh, so I'm a father of a two-year-old, two-and-a-half-year-old, and just thinking how much I love her, and, and uh, it's unbelievable. You don't, like, I don't, I don't love, uh, I don't feel this kind of love to anyone else but my daughter and my wife. And then thinking how much our Father in Heaven loves us, it blows my mind, even even though, you know, my daughter does something that I don't like, but it's my, the love doesn't go away. Same, same way the Father loves us, even though we mess up at times. Um, but if we come to Him and, and repent, he, He's ready to forgive, to forgive our sins. Um, so, all right. So if you guys can join me in prayer, we're going to start uh, this morning. Father God, we are here together to worship You. Um, we are here with willing hearts, God, and um, I was just thinking how much you love us, God, and uh, uh, I, I cannot, cannot understand uh, that kind of love of you sending your only and begotten son to die for me and for everyone else. God, I just so appreciate you and so love you and, and who you are and, and uh, what you do for us and what you have done. God, I pray that you will open hearts tonight, that you will soften hearts today um, and open ears to hear your word and, and have willing hearts to worship your name, God, knowing that you are the only way knowing that you are the only one to deserve, uh, to des that deserves worship, God. Nothing else but you. God, we're ready this morning for you to pour out your spirit here, God. Holy Spirit, come down and fill this room with your presence, with your presence. Come down and fill this room with your presence, Holy Spirit. God, we are so thankful and so ready for you to come and work in our lives. But we're so ready and desperate for you. We need you, God. We need you in here. We need you in our lives. Work through us, God. God, let us be a light for those that don't have you, that don't know you. God, let us shine your, your light. Let us be a vessel for those that need you, God. Give us the words to speak. Let us be examples of who you are and how your kingdom works. God, I pray for those that are far from you this morning. God, I pray that you will bring them back to you. God, I pray that you will reach out to them and you will show yourself to them, God. And bring them back to you, Jesus. Let, let them experience what we experience, God. Open their eyes, God, to see who you are and that there is nothing else where they can find satisfaction, God, but in you. True joy, true peace, God, is in you. God, reveal, those, reveal that to those that are far from you, Jesus, and bring them back to you or bring them to you, God. Okay, God, we're ready to worship you to this morning, and we love you. Um, calm down. We're ready for 
to worship you and for your presence to fill this room. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Uh, will everybody just stand up? We're going to worship Jesus. Amen.
estamos aquí por eso estamos vivos nosotros físicamente sí pero espiritualmente solamente es por él solamente es por su sacrificio may we never forget that every day the air in our lungs the strength in our bodies the destiny that is in us it comes from his blood and his sacrifice and his resurrection from the dead.
has no sting. Come on. Life has no end. For I have been transformed by the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of God. Thank you. Oh, you wash me white. Thank you, Jesus. You have saved my life. Brought me from the darkness into glorious light. There is nothing stronger than the wonder-working power of the blood, the blood. You call the sons and daughters, we've been ransomed by our Father through His blood, His blood. There is, there is nothing stronger than the wonder-working power of the blood, the blood. We've been called, called, called sons and daughters by the ransom by your Father through the blood, the blood. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of life. Thank you, Jesus, you have won. his blood applied. Glory to his name. All the glory, we bring you all the glory. Let's do it again. Glory to was the blood applied. Glory to His name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord.
forever and ever and ever and ever. We will sing to you. We will sing to you. We will lift up the name of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Para siempre y siempre y siempre levantaremos nuestras voces, Señor. A ti que merece toda la gloria, todo el honor, Señor. Bendecimos tu nombre hoy. Amén y amén. Amén, iglesia. Amén. You may be seated. Amen. I'm Fontaine. Good morning. Good to see you here today on this uh, first Sunday in March. I get to talk to you about offering for a moment, and before I do, I just want to um, give you a welcome. Maybe you're here and you need some translation today. We have that for you. In the back today, the table here in the back, we have uh, translation equipment for you and also this Discord app that you can use. And we're grateful that you're here today. I, I had an opportunity to process a little bit this week about who we are and what we are. And I, um, for me, it's, um, it's always special we come together, guys, because a lot of churches that I know of, because we speak at least two languages, they would separate us, and we don't do that. And, and I'm grateful for that. For me, it makes a beautiful community. It, make, it means that. Of at least two languages, we are having some give and some take. And I hope that you're grateful for some give and some take today. I am. I am. I am. Because I love my brothers and sisters, my Guatemalan, my North American, my Korean, uh, wherever you're from today. Welcome to Access Church. We're glad you're here today. We welcome you to the tension uh, where we give and take a little bit. And so you're in a good place. All right, we have four ways to give. And while they pass a basket among you, which is uh, number four, I'm going to talk about a couple more things. And so they'll pass among you. One thing we have today is uh, noticing we have more and more 12-year-olds, sometimes 13, that they need a little help transitioning from kids' church to um, the big big room here and I might be a little too boring and so we have a solution Allison where are you Allison's in the back here and she has for you guys if you're 12 13 or you feel like you're 12 or 13 please see Allison and she's going to help you and she's going to reward you she has an age appropriate uh, guide uh, that goes along with the very scriptures that I'm sharing today and so it, it's, it's going to keep you in the room and keep you up to pace. Welcome to Access, guys. If you're here and you have not been to Welcome to Access, that's coming up on the 24th. Today's the 3rd, so it's three weeks from today. If you could mark your calendar and let us know, because we would love to give you a meal. We share a meal together, and we talk briefly and you leave there getting to know more about access, and you also meet some wonderful people that will help you because it's so nice when you come in the room that you see someone that you know, and you're able to engage with someone and share about the week, and, and that is uh, one of the beautiful things about access. I hope that you'll join us on the 24th. You'll do that through the little QR code. We got a QR code? That QR code. It's probably in the back of your seat or your neighbor's seat. And this is how you get next steps with everything at Access. In fact, today, as I preach in just a moment, we have a brand new uh, guide for you by Pete Scazzaro on Sabbath. 
And it's a great resource tool for you and your family. All you got to do is go to the QR code, and you're going to get a PDF, and you can share it with friends and family uh, via email or WhatsApp. And so that's available for you. That's a tool that we have for you today. It's also the next step to everything at Access Church. Guys, baptism, April 7th. If you would like to be baptized, we would like to give you that opportunity. I'd like to do it right here in the room. we got a tank just outside the door. I heat the tank, and we baptize you so everybody can see. And so that's coming up April 7th. Again, use the QR code and let us know, and we will plan, and we always have extra towels. And so if you're here and you just moved by the Spirit, anybody ever been moved by the Spirit? I have. And you feel like, you know what, today's my day. i got to be baptized today. We can do that. In fact, we have one person, one young man, Josue, baptized last night as Access Knights gathered here. And I got some beautiful pictures of that about 10 o'clock last night. Those guys, Access Knights, they go late and they come early. They're here this morning. But uh, beautiful baptism last night. Lastly, if you are By any chance, you're here today and you're disconnected, meaning you feel like you're here and nobody knows who you are. I won't have you raise your hand. But could you possibly, Izzy, give me the phone number for the church, that 3379? There it is. See, if you're here today, maybe you've been to Welcome to Access, and you still feel, you know what, I don't know anybody yet. And uh, Paul and I want to connect with you. And so I'm not going to call you out, but if you'll simply message on this number and, and just put disconnected or help me or anything, and we want to help you take a next step. So please don't be disconnected today. Please take that next step and use that number. All right. Access Kids, you want to go? Okay. All right, so, guys, we just did about eight weeks, exactly eight weeks from the start of the year to now. We were talking about what it is to be called and sent, and I needed to shift gears a little little bit. Um, Eight weeks is a long time, and I wanted to go a different direction. I was really excited about it, but I really felt like the Lord leading me back to continue and just go on to chapter 12 of Matthew. And I, th- I fought that off till about Wednesday, and I have to make a decision. I thought, okay, Lord, let's, I don't, I'm feeling like you're wanting us to go on to chapter 12, and, and for that reason, that's what we'll do today. And so, uh, spirit-led message, uh, that's possible. <laughs> but that would also mean that God very likely has a word for someone here in this room today besides me. Uh, because this word, it, I, I didn't want to do it because, you know, it, it, it touches some nerve areas in my own life. And I'm, and I'm thinking, you know, it, it just may touch a nerve in some of your lives. Is it okay if I touch a nerve today? All right, I hope so. Because this is also a church where you're likely to get your toes stepped on. Because I love you enough I want to just look at God's truth, and I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. We're not trying to be gummy bear Christians, are we? No. This is not the place for that. But you keep coming, so I'm thinking that you like that too, that you want to be challenged by God's word, that you want to look at his truth, and even if it hurts, this is what we're going to do. God, help me to do what you're asking me to do. And so a heads up, we're going to talk and look at Matthew chapter 12 today as our key verses, and there's a lot of room to cover there. I'm calling this message Lord of the Sabbath, because that's who Jesus says that he is. But to preempt that and to kind of lay the foundation, I've got to talk to you a little bit about legalism. Have you ever heard of that? Maybe a better question is, have you ever experienced that? I have. 
before I ever came to faith. See, I'm wrestling with the Lord. I'm, mess it, I'm wrestling with the gospel. My heart is tender. I want to give my life to Christ. But I don't exactly know how, and I'm not really understanding what they're telling me, but I'm surrounded by people that they're making it a little bit difficult for me because they, they live and they're proud of and they teach, preach, practice even a lot of legalism. And as a teenager, I'm watching that and it, it, it affected, and I, th I think even as I've reflected this week, that it delayed even my ability to cross this line of faith. I've got a line here on the stage. It delayed my ability to do that because I'm looking at their legalistic ways. And I don't know scripture. I only know what their example is and know what they're verbally telling me. And it became very difficult for me to cross a line of faith because I'm not sure that I can live up to even their standards. Or even that I want to. Because when you have not seen Christ transform your life yet... It's a little hard also to understand that he actually wants to do that and that he will do that. That whole, the blood, the power of the blood that we just sang about. That's what I've experienced, but I had not experienced that yet. And so legalism has the ability, I'm afraid, to delay and to stunt the growth of and even push away those who would love to follow Christ So as we approach these scriptures today, I want to ask you a question. Is, do you have any Christian practices that are not supported by scripture in proper context? I had to add that tagline because it's, quite, it's possible you could take a scripture, not fully understand it, skew it a little bit, make it fit your narrative, and so I think it's very fair for all of us in, in terms of self-examination to look today and ask this deep question. As we walk through these scriptures, do you have any Christian practices that are not supported by scripture? Because I, what I have seen and experienced, I got, I got 42 years coming up this next week following Jesus I've seen legalism have a negative effect, sometimes parents to their children. Because you practice legalism and, and your, your kids look at that and think, I, I don't know that I need that or that I want that. And it affects their ability to follow Jesus. Some of you, you practice legalism perhaps, and it affects those that work under you and those that you lead. Let me define legalism. The strict, excessive observance of commands, rules, and regulations in an attempt to foster righteousness. It is a preoccupation with rule keeping to the extent of bypassing love, grace, and mercy. Let me leave that up for a moment. That's and we would talk today, and we, any one of us, I look out quickly, and maybe if someone yet that you're here for the first time, and, or you're not following Jesus yet, and we welcome you here. We're glad you're here today, glad you're curious. But for those who have said yes to Jesus, you would say, I believe, that your righteousness is in Christ. But the message, perhaps, that you send sometimes to others is that you've got to do more. That is Jesus plus some other rules and regulations. I have friends, some that have sat in this very room. They came to Christ. They followed Christ. They repented of their sins. But their progression in the Christian faith had them look back and identify with a lot of rules, commands, regulations, the Pharisees had a lot of them, 600, some 613, some 632, some say, but they had a lot. 
in addition to Ten Commandments, but a lot of extra rules and regulations. And dear people that I know follow Christ, but then get so caught up in historical Old Testament history and bring that into life now and put themselves into a sense of bondage through rules, regulations, and commands Foster, attempting to foster righteousness. Maybe you know some. I do. I, and guys, I love history. I love looking back. I always have. I've loved history. I, I've, I know a lot of um, history from my area of Kentucky I'm from. I look in Guatemalan history. I um, follow a lot of that on social media. I love the old pictures. Love to learn about the way things used to be before there was traffic even. It was amazing. Dirt roads even out, out here on this boulevard. Uh, where we've come from. It's amazing. But I've never personally felt the need to go back and, um, and, and try to pull from that history and live like it's now. Because Jesus came that he would be our righteousness. Jesus came to introduce a new covenant in his blood, a better covenant. The writer of Hebrews clearly lays that out, that we have a new covenant. And so I don't need to go back. And so as a student of history, love it, but no need to go back. Let me give you what, how legalism looks. Typically, displays itself as God's standard of righteousness in three major ways. And you can read here, performance, man-made rules and traditions, and personal preferences. I'm not going to take time to break all those down, but just look at and ask yourself again that question. Any Christian practices that are not supported by Scripture in proper context to where you feel like there has to be some type of performance to complete who you are in Christ. Or there's some man-made rules and traditions. Or some personal preferences. And you look at, you know, this is deeply, uh, I, I've called these personal convictions. But see, when you make your personal convictions and try to pass that off onto me, well, that's not right. Or you try to pass that on to your children. And you've at least got to be up front enough to say, you know, this is a personal conviction for me. And this is why. And it could be something in your family history. It could be some trauma that happened in your life. It, it could be just that you just were brought up that way in, in a certain flavor of the faith for decades. And it kind of just has become part of who you are. At least be honest about that. Parents, your children would appreciate that. Just be honest and say, this is a personal conviction of mine. But it's also a, per it's a personal preference. This was passed on from my grandparents. Okay. Let's look at Scripture. Will you first give me an image of wheat? I want to get these out of order a little bit. Where we're going today, this is what this would look like. A field of wheat. A field of wheat. I just want you to catch this imagery. I meant to tell you something about wheat a minute ago during offering time, but these wheat fields, they left the corners. They didn't, they didn't harvest everything. They left the corners open. And, and so passersby could come by, grab Grab those heads that you see, and they could, they could chew a little bit. I mean, it's not like it's a gourmet meal. It's not tacos. But it is, it is some nourishment, and they, they can keep going. But the principles that God had laid out for them, God, the, those principles were that you were not to consume everything for yourself. And I meant to say that during offering a moment ago. But how did I get to where I'm at in terms of of, of practicing generosity is that these kind of principles, God never intended for you or I to consume everything that's in your hands. You're a manager of what he gives you. And so they left the corners of these fields free so that a passerby, whether they were Jew or not, could come by and, 
and take a hold of those, and they would have some nourishment. They would not be hungry. And it would display to everyone, this is the God that, that, that we serve. He's a generous God. He has more than enough. And see, for me, learning, I had to learn that as a new believer. Because my historically before me is that everyone took everything they had, and that was theirs, and they managed it as so, and they, and they used up 100% and sometimes more than 100%. They had nothing extra. There was no margin in their life. This, this grain field is, a, is an example of margin. And if you sit here today and you feel like, well, I can't be generous, I implore you to take a deeper look and say, is there any margin in your life? Because it could be that you're, you have no margin, and no one's ever talked to you about that. And you can't be generous because you have no margin. Because perhaps you have too much car. You have too much house. And you don't have enough margin. And you're at, at the taco stand, and you see someone that needs a taco, and you have no margin to bless them with a taco. Am I close? Or you, you go buy your $5 coffee, but you don't have any extra to buy anybody else anything because there's no margin in your life. See, I praise God for the ability to see this and see this field and see the, the necessity to build margin into my life and so that I can practice generosity. I love to be generous. My wife loves to be generous. We love to bless other people, but I, we also know that we have to create margin in our life. There's a great principle there. It's not bound in rules and regulation and legalism. It's a bountiful supply of our God who supplies every need. No extra charge for that. Matthew 12. And so we're just wrapping up. We've been in Matthew 10. We've been in Matthew 11. Uh, and Jesus just gave this incredible invitation at the end of chapter 11. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I am gentle and humble, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus gives this incredible invitation to the people, to his audience. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. Verse 1 begins, at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry. It's the Sabbath. It's the Sabbath. And they were hungry. And they began to eat some of the heads of grain. The Pharisees saw this. They said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. Let me explain to you about Sabbath for a moment. I believe that the Bible, and because the Bible says this, and I discovered in seminary, not everybody believes this, but I believe this, that God in a literal six days created everything that we see. I, I, and I argue that. I, I'm not ashamed of that. Scripture tells me that. That's what I'm going to go with. And at the end of those six days, on the seventh day, God rested. Not because he was tired, but he, he, he rested to set an example uh, and set up a principle for us that, that the seventh day would be blessed and be made holy. It made, top, it made number four in the top ten commandments. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Historically, it began at sundown Friday night and ended sundown Saturday night. 24-hour period. And during this time, you would read, you would study, discuss the scriptures, attend the synagogue, spend time with family, friends, and guests at Shabbat meals, rest and worship. On March 7th, 321 A.D., Roman Emperor Constantine issued a civil decree making Sunday a day of rest from labor. And here we sit today. 
That's how we get here. The synagogue had four functions. This was part of their Sabbath. It was to bring Jews together for corporate worship, reading and exaltation of scriptures, corporate prayer time, and a place to teach the, the kids. And then Christianity emerges, and out of that tradition, that's how we gather here today. And we sing, and we pray, and we look, consider the scriptures, and we have a space for our kids. That's how we get here. And Jesus is traveling on the Sabbath with, with his disciples. They're, they go through and they begin to pick some of that grain that you just saw in that photo. And the Pharisees, apparently the Pharisees are out in this field too. Wondering, can we catch, can we catch Jesus doing something wrong? That's their entire purpose. What can we catch here? And they said to him, look. My Bible has an exclamation mark. Like, look. Your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. And Jesus, in verse 3, he answered. He says, haven't you read? He's pointing them back to the Word, pointing them back to the Scriptures. See, this is what I could not do as a, as a teenage young man. I didn't know the Word. I didn't know Scriptures. And so someone said something, well, I don't know. It doesn't seem right to me. I don't like the rule. But I'm going to do it because I don't know any better. That's why some of us do the things that we do, because we don't know any better. Because we are lacking as students of the Word. The more that we know the Word, the more we'll be able to say, just like Jesus did, haven't you read? And correct one another. Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priest. What's he talking about here? <clears throat> I'm sorry, easy. I got these out of order. But Deuteronomy 23. I... Jesus is immediately pointing right back to Scripture. I, wrong Scripture, but let's go with it because I called for it. <laughs> if you enter your neighbor's grain field, you may pick kernels with your hands, but you must not put a sickle to the standing grain. In Kentucky, we had a sickle. It was a little blade, like a, like, almost like a machete, but curved. Don't do that. Can't do that. But you can enter your neighbor's grain field and you can pick some kernels with your hand, which is what they were doing. And Jesus is pointing out what David did. And David does this in 1 Samuel 21 6. Is he's got it? I know she does. So the priest gave him the consecrated bread. Now, if you read this entire chapter, you'll see this priest was nervous. David shows up, he's nervous, doesn't know what to do, but he's got the consecrated bread. And since there was no bread there except the bread of the presence that had been removed from before the Lord and replaced by hot bread on the day it was taken away. So the priest made the decision. David's hungry, and so I'm, I'm going to make a decision in the moment. I'm going to give him bread. That's what the priest did. And so Jesus again Pointing them back. Have you not heard? Do you not remember? And this is what this bread looked like. I think this is another teachable moment. The show bread. We have that image. This is, this is 12 pieces of this. One for each tribe of Israel. And sitting on a table like this. David comes in. This is all you got? I need some bread. I'm hungry. I'm on the run. And so he... That's the bread that, he's, that Jesus is referring to as he's combating the Pharisees in this moment. And if you read all of this, 1 Samuel 21, you see Jesus also, or not Jesus, David, walks out with the sword that, the sword that he took off Goliath's head with is also stored here, and he takes that with him. Extra. <clears throat> A little extra. So that, that, that's what the showbread table looks like. So let me back up because I skipped this and these guys worked hard on these slides. But Izzy, give me the slide, the purpose of Sabbath, because I just recapped that and skipped over it. The 
the purpose of Sabbath. Here's what it was, and that's why I was laying out for you a few minutes ago, for people to rest and take delight in Almighty God. You rest. You work, you rest, you repeat, and you, and you, you spend this time delighting in God. You're, you're showing to everyone that you're trusting Him. You're establishing a rhythm of life, and it's work, rest, repeat. We do it again. We work six days, we rest on the seventh, we repeat. We're distinctive among nations because Israel would shut down for a day. See, there were other nations that did uh, idol worship. They even did sacrifices. But Israel was different because they would shut things down for a day. It sent a message. We trust God. We trust him. He is worthy. And I think I've got one more slide. The Pharisees added to the commandment of Sabbath an entire book of rules and laws. Actually, 39 that I, that I came up with studying this. That in addition to the fourth commandment, they had 39 extra rules and laws that God never gave the people. And in the previous chapters we've been in, here's what Jesus said. The people are weary, they're burdened, and heavy laden. They're harassed, they're helpless like sheep without a shepherd. They're spiritually neglected. That's what Jesus wanted the disciples to see. That's what Jesus sees as he sees the people. And he sees what has happened. They've been, they're, they're heavy laden. They, they can't work out. They can't even enjoy the Sabbath because of what the Pharisees have done to it. There's no love behind it is the thing. When David comes and asks the priest, can I have this bread? And he says, yes, take it because you're hungry. See, there's a, there's a principle of love there. There's a, uh, the motivation for response. You respond to the hungry with love. And I don't want you to go hungry, so yes, eat. And that's what Jesus is pointing out. But let me, let me, let me tell you something about life and about ministry. There are people who are in ministry and doing ministry who do not love people. Do we have that? If not, I'm going to share it later. Because that's the truth. There are people, there are people in your life, there are perhaps even people in this room today. You, you, you're doing ministry, you're doing life, you have people under you, you have a family to lead, or maybe you're just... In your, in your singleness and you're miserable, but you've lost love. You're not operating from love. Everything frustrates you. Everything feels like a burden. Everything makes you weary. Everything makes you heavy laden. You've been harassed and helpless. You've been uh, spiritually neglected. And because of that, you're operating, and maybe you have a position even, but do you really love people? Jesus in this passage, what I love is when these that spiritually neglect people, these that pack the rules on, these that practice legalism, Jesus immediately comes to the defense of his disciples. And there are times in my life and there are times in your life that you need to also come to the, to the defense of those that you're leading, your children, your family. Those of you who lead your work as a ministry, those of you who lead your ministry and you have people under you, you need to come to the defense of them. You are the immediate shepherd and leader, or do you just let them get eaten alive? Jesus gives us the example to go to their defense. Haven't you read? He goes on in verse 5. And we, we just shared this. Or haven't you read in the law on the Sabbath, the priest in the temple desecrate the day, <coughs> excuse me, and yet are innocent? Meaning those priests, they, they do a lot of work on the Sabbath. They're, they're preparing sacrifices. They're, they're preparing everything for worship. They're working on the Sabbath. But, but it's okay. And Jesus is reminding them. It's a work that needs to be done. He goes on. Verse 6, I tell you that one greater than the temple was here. 
blowing their minds. Jesus is blowing up legalism right now. One greater than the temple is here, meaning God in the flesh, Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, standing in this grain field on this day. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. He's referencing Hosea 6.6. 6. We have that, I think. Mercy, not sacrifice. Mercy, not sacrifice. Acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. Again, a motivation of love, of mercy, not sacrifice, not all the things that you perform and do, not all the man-made rules and regulations, not your personal preferences, but it's mercy. If you, had, if you had understood what these words mean, you would not have condemned the innocent. The innocent in this passage is his disciples. He's defending them. He's defending them. I am not going to let you run over these guys. They are hungry and we are on our way for a purpose, and they are operating within the guidelines. And he reminds them, for the, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He's Lord of the Sabbath. He's here. The King is here. It's okay to feed those who are hungry. It's lawful on the Sabbath. Jesus is, in effect, saying he is the Sabbath. Practice work and rest and come unto me, all those who are weary and heavy laden with religion, and I, Jesus, will give you rest, free from rules and regulations and unnecessary burdens, freedom in Christ. Look at Colossians chapter 2 with me for a moment. I only have, I think, one verse for you. But freedom from human rules, the Apostle Paul. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. See, this is good news for me. Good news for me. Because, I, see, I, I come to Christianity. I had a lot of different influences, but I'm thankful to God that I wasn't brought up in a certain way, and I, I was able to just read scripture eventually and learn, and I was motivated because I needed to be able to say, D have you not read? And be able to push back a little bit because I, I, I need, folks, I need my bacon. I, I got a couple of amens. I need my bacon, guys. I, I ordered my, my fresh order this past week from the Mennonite Farm and Tech Pond. If that sounds amazing to you, let me know. I will hook you up. But I, I, I eat pork. I eat a lot of that. I, and I eat a lot of other meats. But, but let no one judge me by what, we, what I eat or drink. I'm going to have to read a few more verses from here because it's important. You go, Paul goes on in verse 17. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. I'm just going to read this. They'll translate it, and then you can look this up later. But I want you to read Colossians 2, 16 through 21. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen, and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. He has lost connection with the head from whom the whole body is supported and held together by its ligaments, disconnected from the body, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ, me, to the basic principles of this world, why, as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with use because they are based on human commands and teachings. Verse 21, such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom. Sounds like it should make sense. That's how things get twisted. 
Sounds okay. We have no discernment. I'm still challenging you in discernment, but it appears to be wise. But it is, Paul says, self-imposed worship, false humility, harsh treatment of the body, lacking value in restraining sensual indulgence. Look that up, please. Colossians 2, beginning in verse 16. Thank you for the new T. Is it okay if we press on? All right, let's keep going. Verse 9 of Matthew 12. Going on from that place, going on from that grain field, he, Jesus, went into their synagogue. These very Pharisees that had challenged him in the grain field, Jesus is on, the way to, on his way to the synagogue on the Sabbath. He's going into their very synagogue. And in that place, there's a man with a shriveled hand was there. The Pharisees, looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, they ask him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And they get full context Look at Mark chapter 3. I won't read all that. But in Mark 3, Mark records the same situation. And he says, Jesus knows their thoughts. And he's aware of who's in the room. He knows what they're thinking, Scripture says. And he tells the man, Jesus knows the man is here with a shriveled hand. And Jesus tells him two things, gives him two commands. First says, stand up. And then he asks a question. In front of everybody, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or do evil, to save life or to kill? And they remain silent, Mark says. And this, he looked around at them in an anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. That, that was Mark's version. This is what Jesus is thinking. He's angered. He's sad. He cannot get over it. These, these people have no love to the point that they would take a person who has a disability, who has a handicap, who has a setback, and they would call, they would allow him to be called out because they want to prove a point with Jesus. They want to trap Jesus. They could care less that this man is embarrassed, perhaps, of his handicap or, or of what has been a, a great source of pain and hurt for him. You look at that shriveled means it, it, it was like without blood. It was useless. It was an extreme handicap. Probably something, I mean, he wouldn't just hold it out. He's probably hiding it a little bit under his robe. So he's operating with one hand, meaning he can't do the work of a normal man to support his family. He's embarrassed. He's having to depend on others to help him, maybe his wife, his children, or his neighbors, his friends. But he's embarrassed of what he holds. The Pharisees, they don't care about that. They're more about the legalism. They're about the law. They're about the details. They're about bringing Jesus down. They could care less about people. And that's what I was just challenging you with and reminding you of. There are people, people even in ministry, and I hope not here today, but it's possible that they actually have lost the ability to love. And they don't see with compassion the way Jesus would have us to see. And Jesus calls this person, has them stand up. Luke 6 records the same thing. Luke 6 and verse 6 says the same thing. Mark and Luke both say Jesus told the guy, stand up in front of everyone and he asked them, is it, is it lawful or not? Is it, is it good or is it evil? Jesus says this. He says to the man, or he says to the room, if any of you, this is verse 11, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? Because they've adjusted the rules on this one. Realizing sheep are part of our economy. It affects our pockets. And so we're changing that rule. 
on, yes, you can pull that sheep out because that, that affects our pockets. That's what Jesus is saying here. Verse 12, how much more valuable is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And get this, Jesus says to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and it was completely restored. Just as sound as the other. A miracle. A miracle. Jesus speaks. And that which looks impossible, that which is great pain and great shame and is, is a source of humility and a, and a, and a defect and a, it's a weakness in life. And Jesus says, stretch out your hand and it's whole. How many of us here, maybe here this morning as we tie these two, this, this all ties together, but you've heard the voice of Jesus to you too, stretch out your hand. Stretch out that which is shame and embarrassment to you. Stretch out to Jesus. Stretch that out to Jesus, that which you're most ashamed of, that which is a handicap to you, that which cripples you, stretch it out. He stretches out to us, stretch out your hand, it's restored. It could be Jesus saying to you, stretch out your hand, be healed. Stretch out your hand, start that ministry. Stretch out your hand, write that book. Stretch out that hand and forgive that person. The Lord of the Sabbath, he speaks. So he stretch toward Jesus with the need that you have. And then stretch toward others for their needs. Sometimes it's not a, a withered hand, but it's a withered heart. That you've been hurt along the way, and maybe it's been legalism, or maybe it's been something else. But you've been hurt. And that hurt has kept you from really functioning and being all that the Lord would have you to be. And maybe you might hear him saying to you today, reach out your hand. Reach out your heart. Allow him to do the miracle that sets you free. It takes faith. It takes faith for that the man with the withered hand to to first of all stand up and then it's an act of faith completely he says stretch out your hand and it's the hand that you're embarrassed of and you stretch it out to Jesus and he breathes new life and he gives us freedom freedom from legalism freedom from a lot of mental trauma that we've we've battled and we carry. He gives us freedom from emotional issues. We've we've been traumatized. We've been hurt. We've experienced pain. Sometimes it's spiritual. Sometimes it's religious. But all the same, it kind of binds us up. It binds our thoughts and our hearts and affects the way that we live daily. And in processing this this week, seeing a Jesus seeing Jesus, Lord of the Sabbath, in a room full of people that have no heart for people, they have no heart for ministry, there's no love motivation, but it's rules and it's regulations and it's legalism. It's making a big deal about Sabbath and this one issue. But Jesus, coming quickly to the defense of his disciples, he does that. He's come to my defense I think in inventory, how many times that I've felt that the need, I, I've got to say something, I've got to defend myself, and, and I've just heard from the Spirit, I got this. Be still. I'll, I'm, I'm defending. I'm, 
I'm at work here. And Jesus doing his amazing, miraculous work in my life and on, in my defense. Anybody else? He's the great defender. More than a song. He's made the crooked path straight. He's, he's done the miracle of, and the heart work. He does that. In this passage, I'm going to wrap this up. But give me the verse 15. I'm just going to read through these and we'll, we'll close today. In verse 14 is the Pharisees, after this miracle, the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. This is the beginning of of them plotting. We, we're not putting up with this. We're not letting anyone. And see, Jesus healed. He just spoke. He didn't even lay hands, didn't touch the person. He spoke it. And they planned to kill him. Aware of this, verse 15, Jesus withdrew from that place. Because sometimes that's the wisest thing to do. You don't have to go toe to toe with everybody. The Lord fighting your battles. And Jesus withdrew from that place. And it might be that that is what we need to do sometimes. We need to withdraw from this angry crowd. But here's what happened. See, a large crowd followed him, and he healed all who were ill. This is the power of the withered hand. This is the power of your testimony. You see, people around you today, they begin to hear of what God has done in your life. Not just the pastor's life, but he's done in your life. And it gathers a crowd because people start to think, you know what, Jesus did that for someone else. Perhaps he would do that for me. And faith begins to arise. And we get to thinking, wow, maybe the, the God that we're reading about, the God that we're reading about on paper, and he's the same God that has not changed, and he did that for others. And they follow him. And he heals how many? All. All who were ill. He warned them not to tell others about him. Let's just keep this low key. No need to put this on the gram. No need for anybody else to know about this. We'll keep it low key. Verse 17, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. This is 700 years before Jesus is born. The prophet Isaiah, here is my servant whom I have chosen. This is the word of the Lord. The one I love and whom I delight, I will put my spirit on him. Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. That's plural. The nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out till he leads justice to victory. Verse 21, in his name, the nations will put their hope. That's the Gentiles. That's the Guatemalans. That's the Koreans. That's the Kentucky boys. West Virginia, Ohio, Texas, all of us. Is there hope in him today? <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, the mighty one, the Lord of the Sabbath, the ruler above all. We worship you today. I thank you that you are our hope. You are our living hope, our King of kings and our Lord of lords. You speak, you speak, and the miracle of the withered hand comes to reality. And God, I believe you're speaking to people in this room today. Maybe they've been caught up, they've been offended, they've been challenged, they've been discouraged by legalism. And today, your word shines and is sharper than a two-edged sword, and you're bringing freedom to individual lives in this room today. Freedom, their emotions, freedom. Freedom in their, their deepest point of pain.
But God, you're speaking freedom. You're breaking chains today in this room today because you are Jesus, the Son of the living God. And you are present in this room today where two or three have gathered together in your name and you have not changed. And God, I pray today as we assess and as we sing, as we do inventory of who you are and what you're calling, God, you're speaking to lives in this room today. Speaking just as sure as I'm speaking right now. You're saying, stand and reach out your hand and see the God of heaven bring what only he can bring. Church, I want you to rise to your feet. I want you to rise to your feet and stand in this room today. And we're going to sing. And we're going to pray. And we're going to see God deliver and set free. And be the source that so many of you need today. Some, some of you are here today and it struck a chord with you because you know that you've not op been operating in love. It's been a while. Everything frustrates you. Everything discourages you. Today... The God of heaven is speaking life and hope to you. Just as he prophesied 700 years before Jesus was even born through the prophet Isaiah. He is our hope in the matchless name of Jesus. Let's sing today with all that you have. Worship the king today. And you feel the freedom to come and pray in this room today in any language. Because he is the Lord. And we worship the one. And we, our audience is one. Worship the King today.
church, sometimes it's up to us. No, it's always up to us to pause and to recognize that the Savior of the Lord, He's the Lord and Savior of all of heaven and all of earth and whatever it is, whatever enemy that's in our presence, whatever voices are telling us that we can't, that we weren't made for what God told us to do, that it's never gonna happen, we're never gonna see his promise come to pass in our lives. It is up to us to say, no sir, the king of kings and the Lord of lords is in charge of my destiny. And today I will yield to his word. And today I will take that step of faith. Lord, I pray for us as a church this week that we will be so aware of your presence and your goodness and your power in our lives because it is absolutely because of you that we are able to do what you've told us to do. Whether we're at work, whether we're with our family, whether we're working it out with our husband or wife, or we're trying to figure out how to raise the children you've given us, we will yield to you this week as the Lord and Savior of all of heaven and all of earth because you are so, so worthy and so, so capable. So this morning we sing all hail. All hail King Jesus. All hail Lord of heaven and earth. All hail King Jesus. Church, have an awesome week in His presence. We love you.